Okay, my name is Mary Saunders and I am part of the Flame Team, the flow of ancient metals across Eurasia um, at the University of Oxford. And what I'm going to talk about is more to do with how we're looking at connectivity within our data set itself. So the Flame project uh, to which I am new, I only started in December, and I don't know anything about archaeometology. I'm a geophysicist, archaeological surveyor, did geomatics. I'm all about data. Um, and the FLAME project itself came from the, this idea that to get away from sort of having an ore and having an artefact and having quite a straight line, to acknowledge that there was a much more complex thing going on and that there were processes happening to metals and to the objects, and to the metals within the object, which could be seen and could be recognised. So what we've got is a large database, I think there's now about 60,000 records, but there's still more to go in, that was developed by Lyra. And most of that data is legacy data. And it comes from all across Eurasia. So we've got Chinese data, Russian data, European data, British data. Um, and what connects that data is that, it, that they are chemical analyses. These data sets are quite incomplete. The spatial distribution can be quite sparse. It can be quite biased. So that has a bearing on what we're going to be able to do, certainly with statistical analysis. Uh, what John and I wanted to do was find a way of displaying this complex metal chemistry, displaying multiple aspects of that metal chemistry at once. And we're looking at changes across space and in time, but we want to be able to expand outwards. So to start with something that works on quite a small spatial scale, but then can be applied to the whole of the region. And obviously, if you're using data from different parts of the world, there, each of those data sets in themselves have different um, expressions of, of how time is described, of how air is described, how the analyses have been done. So we need something that's going to work on that broader scale. And we want to think, ultimately, about further dimensions. So things like typology, uh, things like artefact type. So at the moment we have four dimensions, but we could go much larger. And at the moment we're looking at a, a limited number of um, trace elements, but again we could expand that outwards. So we're trying to design something that can be expanded outwards. So this is just a bit of a test case from uh, England, Wales and Ireland. And you can see how sparsely these data are um, uh, how sparse this data is. <coughs> and these represent sites from which there are artefacts which have had uh, chemical analyses. So we need to start thinking about how are you going to group that spatially? How are you going to group that by time? And what we're looking at specifically is the presence and absence above a certain threshold of a suite of trace elements. And the way that these are present within the metal that is analysed is important in terms of the processes which have occurred to that metal and its journey, I suppose, from ore to ultimately what is analysed. So we need to think about that spatially. How, how are those, the presence and absence of those trace elements, how is that changing across space? How is it changing across time? And we need to think about how to represent this. Because if we go for one dimension, if we have antimony and silver present in, if we're, if we're beginning to stack up multiple analyses, we have two gray squares. If we have them together, uh, if we have them appearing together in analysis, we also have two gray squares. <coughs> and if we have them appearing separately and together, then we just, you can't see that differentiation. So we went for this idea of a 4x4 four four array, 
And you can see how you can begin to separate those different cases out. If they're present individually, we can see that. If they're present together, it's displayed <coughs> differently. And if they're present together and individually, we can still see that as we begin to develop heat maps. So what you come down to are 16 different combinations of those trace elements. And these are related to 16 copper groups which are already used by the project. But what John and I really wanted to do was try and get away from a predetermined group to go back to using the trace elements themselves and maintaining that visual illustration of the presence and absence of the trace elements. And obviously, by using a 4x4, we could expand this out. We could use 20 trace elements if we really wanted to. And it would be very hard to produce 20 maps for 20 periods, for, for 20 maps for 20 sets of elements for X number of regions for X number of time periods. It would become extremely cumbersome. So we're trying to think of something that allows you to, use, to see all these presence and absence of elements across these regions and time spaces in a bit more of a manageable way. So what this represents are the data for the early Bronze Age. And these are heat maps. So for each region, we've created a heat map for all the analysis, analyses in that region to show which of those element combinations are present. The regions themselves were predetermined by the data set that I was given, and the time periods are predetermined. Now, this is something I really think we need to get away from, because these regions don't really mean anything, not, not in the Bronze Age. And those time periods are very specific to Britain. And if we're trying to expand this outwards to Eurasia, we need to get away from these very specific labels for time which means certain things, but only in certain places. So you can see, when we look at our diagram of the, of the trace elements, you can begin to pick out definite presences of, of certain combinations of elements. Um, particularly in Ireland, we haven't got any nickel. Um, something very different is happening in Wales to the south of England. And I suppose for me as a, a non-specialist, I just want to find a way that I could display this and make something that looks meaningful and that people understand. It is, it's up to the metal chemists to then make the interpretation. So then we're looking across the Bronze Age for these areas and you can see there are quite definite and distinct changes that occur. And it's the change that is the interesting thing. And it's very easy to take these three snapshots, but what, what is happening in between? And actually, is it valid to take these three time periods as the times that you look at? Is that when the change is really occurring, or are we sort of shoehorning it into a convenient box? So you can see, when again you look at these 16 different um, combinations of trace elements, you can begin to see what is happening. And the way that certain combinations of elements are added to the system or removed from the system is not random, and it, and it obviously has meaning, and it's that meaning we also have to draw out. So, looking at Wales and the southwest of England, you can see that we're gaining certain elements and we're losing others. And the way that these changes occur and the combinations in which they occur, so the combinations of those trace elements groups that we lose or that we gain are very significant. So we need to see <coughs> those specific changes and find a way of understanding and displaying and <coughs> analysing those. And you can see how Particularly group 11 is, is gained in the southwest, and you can see that you're losing the um, antimony and silver sort of 
is going out of the system, and, and that is not by chance. So if we can, we know that these changes happen to the metal, and we can see those changes. And if we can see those changes, then we can see what happened to the metal in the first place. So we're almost going backwards with the data. We're trying to find those changes, or, or what we'd really like to do is to start off by finding the changes and then relate them to what's happening in the system. And in terms of time, as I've said, across Eurasia, the way that time is, is labelled or defined differs greatly. So we need to start looking at how these different periods connect together. Um, where does the maximum amount of change happen? It doesn't happen to ha it doesn't have to be at the same place in the, uh, at the same time. So we're almost beginning to get into this multidimensional space where, you, where you're getting the greatest rate of, rate of change in multiple dimensions, and it is that point of the greatest rate of change which is of significance. And in terms of areas, we could do something with hydrological boundaries. These are river basin districts. But in Scotland, apparently all of Scotland, it's one river basin district, which to my mind is a little bit odd. So perhaps that's not the most appropriate. And again, something where we're looking at how those different areas are connecting to each other, how the metal chemistry is changing spatially and allowing that to allow us to, to extract the point where the change occurs. So we've got this very fuzzy, curvy, multi-dimensional interface almost, which is very hard to visualise and will be very hard to model, but I think this is the only way that you can get something that is truly representative of how the metal behaves through time and space and the connections between different periods and different places. So we were trying to move away from a, a very sort of rigid classification system and look more at the changes over time and space and allowing the data to tell its own story, which is something that as someone who does data, I'm far more used to, to doing. But we find that this, is really, this particular case is really difficult. We came up with a way to model the metal chemistry, but it wasn't straightforward. It was difficult to, sim to symbolise it. I can look at that data and I can see patterns and I know that, these, that, that there is information in there, but I find it very hard to, to find a way to show that in a way that I understand, in a way that's acceptable to the metallurgists, in a way that non-specialists would, would be interested in. And where do you start if you're looking at change? It's all very well to say we're going to get away from ores to artefacts. But if you don't have a starting case, how do you measure change? So that's something we need to look at and, and find a way of addressing. And frankly, the people on the project were really quite lukewarm when we showed them this, um, <laughs> which is <laughs> not unusual for people who, data, who do data versus people who, who don't. But there has to be a way of drawing out these, these changes and uh, the way that the metal is being treated. And there must be a way of, of doing it spatially and multidimensionally, but it's just how to express that and communicate that better. And what's really important is that we've got this massive data set over a huge spatial area of quite a broad time scale. We can't show 475 maps to illustrate what we're doing. We need to have something more advanced, and we need to have something that's using statistics, that's using visualisation, and it's just how do we do that? And, and well, how do we find a way to show what we know is already in that data set? So, thank you very much.